We learned in the previous module that bacteria and viruses, collectively called germs, cause respiratory infections. And while antibiotics and vaccines are important in the treatment and prevention of diseases, we can also play a big role in reducing the spread of infectious respiratory diseases by properly monitoring our indoor air quality. To understand the connection between these diseases and indoor air quality, we first need to understand how germs are transmitted from person to person. While viruses and bacteria multiply inside our bodies, they also try to spread to as many other people as possible so they can keep surviving, multiplying, and spreading. There's two main ways for germs to pass from person to person. The first way is through physical contact. Respiratory germs tend to live in the fluids in our respiratory system. Think about saliva or snot. If someone else comes into physical contact with a contaminated fluid, for example, through a handshake, there's a chance that some of the germs will be passed on and eventually make it inside a new person and cause them to get sick. This is one of the reasons that we're all encouraged to wash our hands regularly. It can help reduce transmission from direct contact. However, physical contact is not all that efficient at transmitting the germs that cause respiratory infections. Instead, most respiratory infections are caused by germs passed between people through the air. Why is this? Well, whenever we breathe or talk or cough, there's processes that go on in our lungs, our vocal cords, and our mouth that create airborne particles. These are often referred to as respiratory particles and are released into the air when we exhale. They're mostly made up of our saliva and other respiratory fluids. We release these particles all the time, whether we're sick or healthy. However, when we're sick, there's a chance that some of these particles carry our sick germs with them. That is, we can release viruses or bacteria into the air when we're sick because the germs can hitch a ride on the particles that we already naturally produce. Because bacteria tend to be a lot bigger than viruses, bacteria tend to hitch rides only on the relatively large particles. Viruses, on the other hand, can hitch a ride on most of the particles that we produce. Once the germs get out of our body and into the air on our exhaled particles, there's a chance that somebody else will breathe in these particles and get sick themselves. Respiratory particles can range a lot in size, from some that are relatively small to others that are comparably big. How big is the difference though? Well, let's scale them up to objects that we, we know. Imagine that the relatively small particles, which are also the most common, are about the size of a marble. Well, we also produce particles that are 10 times bigger, about the size of a soccer ball, and particles that are 10 times bigger than even that, about the size of a boulder. And we can even make particles that are 10 times bigger still, the equivalent size of a blue whale. The actual particles that we're dealing with are, of course, much smaller, about 100,000 times smaller. It's really only the largest particles, the whales, that we can see with our eyes. And because we can see them, the visible particles are often the ones that people think about. But if we were to go around counting the particles that we emit and grouping them according to their size, let's say small, medium, large, and huge, we find out that there's a lot of small particles about 10 times fewer of the medium ones, 10 times fewer still of the large ones, and even 10 times fewer of the huge ones. That is, for every one whale particle, we might have hundreds of thousands or even millions of marble particles. In practice, when people talk about respiratory particles, they tend to divide them into two groups, aerosols and droplets. We generally consider aerosols to be small particles and droplets really big particles. Although people disagree on where to draw the dividing line between small and big, we can think of it as being somewhere around 50 microns, which is similar to the width of a human hair. So why do we care about the number and size of particles? Well, both are important when we think about disease transmission. A greater number of particles means it's more likely that people breathe in a germ-containing particle and get sick. And size of the particles matters because, as we learned in the first module series, size controls how long the particles can float in the air. Really big particles like droplets tend to fall out of the air due to gravity, but small particles like aerosols can float in the air for a very long time. This means that small particles greatly increase the risk of disease transmission because they allow the germs that are hitching a ride on them 
to float in the air until somebody else breathes them in. Because small particles can float in the air for so long, and because more particles in the air mean more chances that the people in a room get sick, it's important that we use our air quality improvement strategies to remove particles from the air and keep people healthy. So as we talk in the next modules about how and where particles are made in our respiratory system, keep in mind that it's the smallest particles that we're most concerned about for airborne disease transmission.